and welcome to Cancer, a Love Yourself Story, where we ask hard questions and we have healing conversations. What if a cancer diagnosis doesn't have to be the end of your life as you know it, but instead a beautiful invitation to become the best version of yourself? Well, today we get to talk to a cancer warrior and an all-around amazing woman, Karen Hall, who runs Cancer Support Team, a nonprofit organization that helps women with wigs and in actually multitudes of other ways. She's a, a cancer survivor herself, and she's agreed to meet with us today to talk about her journey and the hope that she spreads throughout the community. Her Chicago-based 501c3 is an amazing organization that I've had the privilege of just barely opening the door to witness. And I'm telling you, there are some healing conversations going on here. So Karen, welcome to the podcast today. I'm so honored to have you. Thank you so much, Julie. It's such an honor and a privilege to be here. Thank you. Thank you. So I guess I, I, the first thing that I want to talk about is I'd like to hear a little bit about your cancer journey and what led you to this method of service, how you serve the community. So tell me a little bit about yourself. Well, uh, my cancer journey started in 2005. I was working uh, at a very high demanding, you know, very stressful, uh, task driven job. And so I was put on medical leave. And during that time, I said, okay, this is a great time for me to do my annual checkups. And so it was time for my mammogram. And so I went to get my mammogram. And of course, you know, we get the ultrasound. And then I had to go back and get the biopsy, you know. And then once you get the call that says you have an appointment on this day and this time, you knew it was serious. And so that's when the surgeon told me that I had breast cancer. Um, from the time I took the mammogram until I was told that I had breast cancer, my life was just terrible. It just went upside down. I was just, I was scared because all I knew about cancer was you die, you know? And so that was my whole knowledge base uh, about what cancer was. And so I, after being diagnosed with stage zero breast cancer, I went home, I did the whole ugly cry, you know, uh, why me and all of that other stuff, you know, and I was thinking about my family, you know, how is my family gonna handle this if I die? And then I decided, okay, so what are you gonna do? You're gonna fight. You're gonna fight because you want to live. And so that's when I became my own advocate. I started learning all I could about the type of breast cancer that I had um, and just being very positive about it. Yes, it was a horrible journey. I wouldn't recommend it on anyone, um, but I just decided I'm just gonna be there. And, that, and that's all it is. So I ended up having a mastectomy reconstruction after my reconstruction, about a year, I developed a, an infection. And so I had to have corrective surgery. Um, and then after the corrective surgery, I took the tamox tamoxifen for five years. Oh, it was wonderful, you know? I did my 5K walk, you know? I was like, hey, cancer is behind me. My whole life is in front of me. Let's do this, you know? I tried to... I go to a support group at that time. And I was like, I'm not like these people, you know, I'm not, you know, ashy and I have still have my hair and all of that, you know, uh, and I wasn't doubting them, but I just couldn't relate at that time, not knowing that three years later, I would have a recurrence of cancer. And at that time it was an aggressive tumor on the same side as I had my mastectomy. Um, then I had to go through the chemo and radiation and Herceptin and the surgery, uh, you know, to remove the, the last part of the tumor. That's when my life literally turned upside down. Um, it was just so hard for me to grasp 
Then I caught it again. You know, I was stage zero the first time, you know, who would ever thought that I would have to ever deal with this again? Because if anything, that was the best stage to be. Yeah. So let me ask you, when you had stage zero, did you have, and you said you had a mastectomy, was that just on one side? Yes. So then, yes. Yeah. So then it, the, the cancer returned in the other breast at that time? Yeah. No. The what? cancer returned on the breast chest wall. Wow. So it was on the same side as I had my mastectomy, but your breast goes all the way up here. They still consider that your breast chest wall. And so the tumor was here. And how did you discover it? I, I seen a little bump. Right. And I was like, oh, you know, I was itching a little bit. That's no big deal. You know, um, and then my my friend, she she says, you know, that little bump up there looks like it's, it's getting bigger. And I was like, oh, no, it's not, you know, but don't worry. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll look at it when I go to the doctor, you know. And so when I again, when I, I uh, had time to go to the doctor, I went to my primary. And, you know, I was like, I don't know what this is. And he says, well, I don't know, but it's on the same side as you had your mastectomy. So he sent me to the plastic surgeon. Um, and I went to the plastic surgeon and he said, no, it's nothing I did. So he immediately called the hospital where I originally got treated and talked to the uh, oncologist nurse and she called me on my on my drive home and said, Karen, you have an appointment tomorrow to come in for a mammogram. Wow. And so, and then it started with the mammogram, the ultrasound, and the biopsy. And once they did the biopsy, they did determine that it was cancer and it was a tumor. Yes. So did you have another surgery then to follow? Yes, I started with the chemo, you know, I went through my chemo uh, process, the Herceptin for a year, uh, and then uh, after radiation, I had the uh, surgery because they waited until the end because to see how well uh, I was doing as far as the chemo, it shrank the tumor you know, a little, and then after the radiation, it did shrink it some more, but there was still just maybe one or two centimeters left. And so that's when they decided to do the surgery. You know, I don't think that people realize, I know I didn't realize at the beginning of my cancer journey that this stuff was gonna take so long. You know, I, I thought it was gonna be like a bump in the road. I'd be back to my 70 hour work week, all would be well. And then my doctor said, oh, basically you're gonna have to write off 2017 and I'm like what 2007 that's a whole year what am I supposed to be doing with that so I don't think people understand how seriously just treatment after treatment after treatment depletes your spirit and all of your body changes that happen so what did you experience with that oh my god uh so the first the first chemo experience that I had was the worst I, I had everything. I had, you know, the diarrhea. I had, the, you know, the vomiting. Um, I had actually, you know, and just to be perfectly honest, um, I couldn't make it to the bathroom. I was in the bed when the diarrhea started. Yes. And so I didn't, I was not able to make it to the bathroom in time. Um, I had the, uh, the, the, the rapidity, you know, with the fingers, the dry mouth, you know, everything imaginable um, I had, you know. The first treatment was the worst, and I believe it was the worst because of the stress and anxiety. I didn't know what was going to happen, and all of this stuff was new to me. So the first one really was the worst. After that, I said, I know I'm gonna have, I know I'm gonna have side effects, but I refuse to have anything over mild. And, and I stayed with that. So all of the other side effects after that were mild. 
You know. You have the best attitude. <laughs> you exude that. You have this this absolute sunshine about you. So I can see that. Um, I know that I also made a decision on how I was going to experience it. Yeah. I think it's so important that we communicate to women that as you're going through this experience, you must form your narrative. You must decide how you will experience this. Yeah. Right, you got to get. You got to put that armor on. You got to experience it like a warrior, mm -hmm. and you know what? You got to be in charge, right? Yeah, absolutely. I know one of the things. You know, the second time when I had the recurrence, I think that I handled that was worse than the first time. Mm -hmm. um, simply because it was definitely unexpected, right. and. I needed uh, spiritual counseling for that because I just, I, I was having a hard time, you know, I was doubting my faith, you know, I'm doing everything that I'm supposed to do, you know, I'm, I'm going to church, you know, I'm studying, I'm doing all of this, you know, I have a great attitude about everything, you know, I'm eating well, you know, why did it come back? And so I did have uh, some spiritual counseling to kind of help me uh, adjust you know, spiritually uh, to dealing with this now because everything that I knew about life changed when I got that, that second one. The first one, was, it was a bump in the road for me, but the second one, my life totally changed. Um, my body, you know, I had to get used to my body being different now. That, so my self-esteem was gone you know, so I have these body images now that, you know, I'm not comfortable, you know, showing people, you know, my body. So it, it was a, it's a lot of adjustment, you know, with the mental uh, changes, your, your, um, your, um, oh, I just lost my thought. Well, you know, I, I really have been, I've been seeing a lot of uh, postings on mental health and cancer. Oh, yes. And I just don't think we can spend too much time talking about that. I think that's so important. And especially mm -hmm. in, in your mission. So how did that lead you to the mission that you, with your 501c3? How did that, tell me a little bit about how that evolved. Okay. Actually, it started, it started after my first diagnosis in 2005, I guess, because uh, I handled this so very well, or at least I presented myself to the to the public so very well, because we still have those inner battles that we're doing. Uh, people just started, you know, hey, I have this friend that's just been diagnosed. You handled it very well. Can you talk to them? You know, I have this person I'm working with. Can you talk to them? So at that time, I just, I started being very vocal. I did not want it to be a private thing because I didn't want to suffer in silence. And so I was open to helping other people. So that's when the desire to do this really uh, came in my heart. And then when I went to Cancer uh, Treatments of America, they offered a training session uh, for laymen, for churches to start their own cancer ministry. And so that's when I, I was really started getting serious about it. So I was the director of the healthcare ministry at my church, which was doing essentially the same thing, supporting uh, families exactly with uh, that has been diagnosed with cancer. And then after that last year, I decided to uh, to provide this type of service uh, independent of the church. That's, that's absolutely beautiful. And I would like to mention that you have a cancer support group for cancer patients uh, once a month, and you also have a cancer support group for caregivers once a month. Yeah. And then I think you just shared with me that you also do something on Thursdays and Tuesdays, <laughs> right? Yes. Um, yes. So. What I do on Tuesdays um, with my church, I am a licensed UFBL teacher. And so uh, this semester I'm teaching a forgiveness course, which is so awesome because forgiving yourself, even with the cancer diagnosis, 
You know, we like to beat ourselves up about it. You know, how did this happen to me? And so you have to forgive yourself and just understand where you are in order to move forward. And so I'm involved, I'm, do, I'm facilitating that class. And then on Tuesdays, I'm part of Thursdays, I'm part of a group that's called Thankful Thursday with the Gildas Club. And the Gildas Club, I've been a volunteer with the Gildas Club for seven years, probably. And part of what I do for them is I do their outreach, going out into the community and sharing information about the Gildas Club. And also I'm part of their panel that they use for survival speakers when they need to send a survivor out and do a presentation. And so I, I handle that as well. So the Thankful Thursday is just an awesome group of ladies that we get together and we, every week, we have an opportunity to discover what we're so thankful for, you know, and we all think it's the big things, you know, and just being thankful that I'm able to get up today, just being thankful that my best friend called me today, you know, something just as simple as that, just to make you feel better about yourself. That's beautiful. I'm actually doing a gratitude challenge on social media starting on the 22nd. Yeah. And so uh, I'm at, it's a 30 day challenge. Okay. We're going to make something that demonstrates our gratitude and then we're, we're going to use it on our Thanksgiving table. So it's going to be beautiful. So oh. hopefully, hopefully you'll get something that we could maybe do together. That's kind of yes. cool. Yeah, uh, that sounds awesome. Yeah. So, you know, I want to just back up a little bit when talk about um, one of your missions that really caught my eye, and that's how you provide wigs for people that are in the middle of cancer treatment. So um, I guess what I want, to, I want the audience to know is how does a woman feel when she loses her hair? I know like for me, it was my favorite thing about myself, and that was one of the most challenging parts I was so freaked out about losing my hair, what was I gonna look like, um, and that sort of thing. But you help ease women through that transition by helping them feel more empowered and beautiful and in charge of how they yes. feel. Yes. So tell me a little bit about how they feel and then what you do to help. Okay, so how this whole wig, wig program came up. Before I started Cancer Support Team, I, uh, actually I still am, a volunteer for American Cancer Society. And I was part of their wig boutique. And what I found with that is that women come in that has been newly diagnosed, um, they're afraid, you know, um, they're scared. They, it's just another loss, you know. You've been told you have cancer, right? Now you've been told you have to go through treatment. Now just you're losing something again. Now you're being told that you're gonna lose your hair. Not just the hair on your head. You lose all of the hair on your body, which makes you look totally different than what you're accustomed to. And so providing a wig helps a, a, a woman feel, get that self-confidence about themselves give them the drive to want to continue on fighting the journey of living is what I call it. It helps them to find that inner beauty that is within them that oftentimes get overshadowed with all of this physical changes that we go through. And, and so you, that's why I thought it was important that I'd start that. And don't you feel like it's just a tiny bit of normal in the middle of all the crazy like okay i know that all of these things are i'm i'm now you know like for me i felt like frankenstein between all the surgeries that i had and i felt like everything was i was so out of control and it was the one thing that i could do that made me feel just the tiniest bit normal yes. and so you provide this this sense of ah okay i can just rest in this and, and I did things like I became, I, I bought wigs, like a pink wig and I bought a, um, a red wig. I always wanted to be a redhead. <laughs> and so it's a huge service. And really, it, you know, I'm sure, you know, tell me some of the things that you experience. Like what's some of the feedback you get from people 
as you help them with wigs? Well, um, I help them to, to just talk about it, mm -hmm. right? Um, I had this one uh, lady, she was, um, we didn't talk, we didn't speak the same language, so her husband came in. And she had long, long, long black hair. And she, she was very despondent about that. And I had said to her uh, through him is that, you know, he says, I try to tell her she's beautiful without the hair. I says, but you don't understand. She's lost yet another part of herself. That's part of her identity. Right. You know, and so we help her kind of find her identity, as you said, back. You know, <laughs> and she just started smiling once I put the wig on her, and she, you, you, you seen all of all of the life comes back into her face. You know, she felt happy again. You know, and I said, if she wants to wear the wig to bed, let her. If whatever it takes to make her feel good about herself, you know. Yes. Uh, yeah. So it, and it's an opportunity for you to try something different, as you say. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So I am super excited to announce that um, Karen has agreed to do a wig demonstration because I remember when I was picking out my wigs, I didn't know how to take care of them. I didn't know how to put them on. I didn't know any of that thing. So, so um, are you ready to do your wig demonstration? Yes, absolutely. So I'm going to stand up. And I think you have a special guest, right? And I have a special guest. And Miss Sandra is my Hi, special Sandra. guest. Hi, Sandra. Thank you so much for being with us today. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. How about you? Oh, good. God bless you. Are you in the middle of treatment now? No. Oh, thank goodness. No. No. Thank goodness. Okay. All right. So you are going to be our, um, our model and Karen, and for those of you that are going to be listening on audio, make sure you come back and watch this on the YouTube channel, uh, or the, or the podcast on Podbean. You're going to be able to see how we do this. Um, and, and Karen's going to give us all the tips and tricks of how you successfully wear a wig. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I'm just preparing myself uh, because of the COVID-19 naturally. So we both put on our, 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 our masks. And prior to the meeting, of course, you know, on the phone, we have to talk about um, to make sure that she hasn't been exposed to COVID-19, no fever, or been out of the country or anything like that. And so we have both, you know, agreed that we're good. And so all of the answers are no to that. And she has her mask on, I have my mask on. And by me touching her, I'm just being secure a little bit and I put my gloves on. So the first thing we do is we find a wig. And so Sandra, she went on our website and she decided that this is the wig that she wants. So the first thing that we do in order to put the wig on, we lay it flat. And the tags that is, is the, the tags are the back of the wig. Can you hold up it to the screen just a little bit? Okay, very good. So the tags is the back of the wig, right? Mm -hmm. On the sides are the ear tabs. And so to put the wig on, we take the ear tabs and the back and we place it on the head as such. So I'm going to demonstrate on Sandra. So I noticed she has a cap on. Does that, tip, does that happen all the time? I yeah. guess if you're, if you're bald, do you still wear a cap? Okay. Oh yeah, that's, that's a good question. So, uh, for the demonstration, definitely, we always ask to wear a wig, uh, a wig cap. Uh, mostly, most people do wear a wig cap. There are several things when it comes to a person that does not have hair, mm -hmm. okay? There are a uh, couple of options that they can use. There is a, uh, uh, it's called a wig band that goes around, and so that grabs the wig and keeps it on your hair. It's 
on your head, especially if you um, do not have any hair. Another thing that we can use, or I found the trick, is just to use a cotton scarf. And you place the cotton scarf against your head because our hair, our head is really tender at times when we lose our hair. It's very, very tender. So it feels, the cotton feels really good on your head. Then you would place the wig cap on. Then you would place the wig on. Okay. 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 So we're going to take the wig and we're going to place it, start from the back. The wig from the top should be about four fingers between the top of your eyebrow and your natural hairline. Okay. So that would be a good placement where the wig should go. All right. Check the tabs. On the side, once your two ear tabs are, are comfortably in front of your ears, that indicates that the wig is on straight. We make sure that the wig is pulled all the way to the bottom. And now you can adjust. It's not on. Now, for our synthetic wigs, they generally come with a style, okay? And so it's very difficult to brush it away from the style that it's been made for, mm -hmm. okay? So you would simply brush it. And so we're going to ask Miss Sandra to turn a little bit toward the, so that we can see. That's gorgeous. Okay. I love it. I love the color. <laughs> To brush, to get the hair out of your face, mm -hmm. we simply take it and we brush it, right? So it really just kind of depends on how a person wants to wear. Now, how do we maintain this wig? Study says that every six to eight wears, you should wash it. Um, how do you wash the wig? You take a tablespoon full of shampoo and you put it in cold water in a sink or a basket and you make sure it's nice and sudsy and then you place the wig with the cap up, down, and you, you submerge it into the water. Do not rub do, <laughs> and do not twist. So you, now, if it's a little um, tangled, you simply take your fingers and you would just wipe in the direction that the hair is flowing. And don't you use like a wide brush for that? Yes. Yeah. I, I know like sometimes regular brushes don't work, but a wide brush is appropriate. Yeah, they, they recommend that um, uh, you use a wide brush wig wig brush okay okay and that simply works uh, for the first time you definitely should wash your wig uh and that's simply just to keep you safe uh, you know especially if you're going through treatment that's just to keep you safe and just to know that that it is nice and clean for you sure uh to condition uh you would use the the same concept is you take the conditioner, you put it in your hand, and then you, you can rub it, avoiding the cap itself. Another way you can condition it by using conditioning spray and just simply lightly spray it. I think that's what I had, actually. Yeah, the conditioning spray? Yes. Yeah. So what if it's not secure on your head? At the, on the back of the wig, there are, in, there are adjusters. So you can adjust it so that it can fit comfortably. You don't want it too tight mm -hmm. and you don't want it loose where if you shake your head, the wig loose. Okay. 
And I remember these can be quite pricey. I was fortunate enough, um, some of my friends um, had a GoFundMe and I used some of that. But in some of those wigs, I was so amazed they were three, four, five hundred dollars a piece. Yes. I mean, they can be yes. so expensive. And yes. so, and then I learned after I purchased a couple that um, I could have gotten free ones through the American Cancer Society. And I was just like, oh, that's such a beautiful gift to women who do not have the option for that, right? That and, is true, yes. And, and I think you've been gifted uh, a, a good set of them lately, right? Yes, the American Cancer Society, because I, have the, I was a volunteer and they ceased uh, providing the service because of COVID-19. And so I asked if they would gift me with some uh, wigs. And so they did gift me with about 50 wigs. So, which gave me the opportunity to start my, my crowning star wig program. And why do I call it crowning star? Because I figure every cancer patient and every lady that's living with alopecia is a star. Yes. And we want to crown them and so that they can see and reflect the, the, the star in which they are. That's so beautiful, Karen. Yeah. And, and so for people who may not be familiar with that, can you tell us what alopecia is? Alopecia is when a person um, uh, loses their hair or sometimes their hair just will not grow back. Uh, often, sometimes after a person has gone through chemo, and because of the chemo has damaged so many uh, hair cells and follicles in their hair, they're unable to grow their hair back. You know, I, knew, I do know uh, several ladies who uh, are not able to uh, grow it, their hair. And often, no. like mine came in completely differently. Like this isn't, this is maybe a third of the amount that I used to have as far as the thickness is concerned. Mm -hmm. And it grew in a different color. Sometimes it grows in curly, like mine was curly at first and then completely straight. Like you, it's, you'd never know what you're going to get. Um, right. as your hair grows back. Now right? that is the truth. You yeah. never know when your hair grows back. Oh my God, it is so different. Yeah. You know, my hair came back like when I was a baby. You know, which was was nice. It was silky. You know, it was manageable. You know, um, the one thing for me though, it wasn't the hair on my head. It was my eyebrows. Yes, <laughs> yes I, miss my, I miss my eyebrows the most. Right? I mean, because here's the thing. So, so you don't have to shave for like a year. So that's a gift. Right. Right? That's a total bonus. You don't have to right. spare. You don't have to spend money on hair products. So I saved right. them money there. Right. But I had no eyebrows and no eyelashes. And right. so how do you know if I'm excited? If I have, <laughs> I, I got to, my wrinkles got to do all the work, right? Mm -hmm. So now, are you excited? I don't know. <laughs> you have to look at my wrinkles, right? So when I got my eyebrows back, I was like, bonus, total bonus. Yeah. Yeah. Now you can see what I'm thinking. And my eyelashes right. came back. I was so grateful. Um, but some people's never come back. Mine. <sighs> Mine never came back. Well, I wouldn't. And know. So I have I have been on a on a search, <laughs> learning how to put on the perfect eyebrows. So <laughs> wow, well, your eyebrows look amazing. I would never have guessed that. No, they're not. But wow, yeah, it's um. This is a, a wonderful journey for me. <laughs> this is a beautiful uh, thing that I'm doing. I have been so blessed with supporting ladies uh, when they come in for wigs. It's an opportunity for me to support them. It's an opportunity for me to uh, share with their, um, with their, their family member that's supporting them. Uh, and so it's just, it's just a wonderful thing to do. And for them, it just, it just fills my heart because I can see how it makes them feel. Yes, absolutely. And, um, and I love that wig on her. And I know that I didn't talk to you about this, but I saved, I gave all my wigs away to people. I, I passed it, you know, paid it forward and uh -huh. gave people who could use them except for my one beautiful wig. Oh! I, do you mind if I try it on with you right now? Yes! <laughs> yes! 
So I don't have all like the fancy head cap that you do, but I'm gonna try this on. So this is what I'm telling people as they go back, right? We can, you can actually um, like save your sexiest wig for date night <laughs> later on, right? Yeah. A whole lot. So this is the color that my hair used to be. Mm. Hold on. Let me see if wow. I can get it on and get it pretty. Oh, I don't know. It's a whole different look, right? Yeah. Let's see here. There you go. How's it look? Look that. Almost there? Oh my gosh. This is awesome. So yes. And so one one year, one night last year, I tried this on with my little black dress and I'm like, oh, not too bad. <laughs> it's like you're dating a different woman, honey. <laughs> hmm. Right? So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's <cute. laughs> yeah, see, that's the benefit of long of having long hair. You can be yes. so versatile. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm digging this. So yeah. So, so fall in love with your wigs, fall in yeah. love with you look, play with it a little bit, right? Yeah. It's a yeah. good time because how many times do we get to change our looks on purpose? That's right. Right. That's I mean, right. Absolutely. A, so let's just take a negative and let's flip it to a positive and yeah. then, you know, realize that I can only see myself like in a one inch thing. I have no idea how this really looks right now, but I do, I did have a good time. Yeah, so. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, darling. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Sandra. So, all right, so let's just have the last part of our conversation because I I see on your on your bio that, holy smokes, you are a rock star. You have been on Dick Durbin's committee for the Affordable Care Act. You're on Black Women Speak. You are on the American Cancer Society site. You are, you are just a rock star with your speaking. So, <laughs> So tell me a little bit, I am super interested in, in fact, I was so honored to attend your cancer, uh, your patient, yes. your patient survivor yeah. group, um, last week. And I was just privileged to be part of that conversation. And it was so interesting because it opened my eyes in, um, in a way that I was completely amazed at in the way that there's a, the difference between the level of care that mm -hmm. the black and brown community receives and yes. the Caucasian community receives. That's right. And is there anything that you'd want to share with the audience now so that we can help people become aware that there is a disparity between how we are, how people are treated and how people are cared for when they're having cancer? Yes. So the reason why I did go to uh, Senator Durbin's uh, press content conference, it was uh, about the Affordable Care Act. And I know for me personally, um, if that act didn't exist, I would not have been able to receive quality care when my cancer came back. Some of the things that uh, in our black and brown communities uh, we're faced with is, not being able to get quality uh, care. Uh, the other thing is oftentimes we don't have insurance. Uh, there are hospitals out there that used to provide mammograms free, but found out that not as many is doing that in our communities any longer because if you do test positive for cancer, they are required by law to treat you even if you don't have cancer. I mean, even if you don't have insurance. Wow. So that's one of the disparities, you know, that we really need to work with. Uh, another one is educating our communities on the particular risks. Uh, is, you know, most people believe that cancer is hereditary and that's not the case. Only about 15% of uh, people diagnosed with cancer is hereditary. I know me, myself personally, no one in my family at all has cancer. And so, you know, uh, so it was really a shock for me. Another thing that, that, um, that we face with is fear. You know, it's fear. If I don't know about it, I can't do anything about it. Um, and so, you know, I'm here to say, you know, 
early detection is the best, you know. You have to do your mammograms, you know. Keep seeking uh, to be able to get it. Uh, call on any resource that you have. Contact the American Cancer Society. Contact Cancer Support Team. We will help you find a, an organization that will give you uh, free mammograms. It's very, very important. Um, I, I do understand that um, women are getting diagnosed, they're younger. You know, they, they're younger now. And then those that are diagnosed that are younger, their cancer is more aggressive. You know, and so it's um, it's 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 important. It's important that we keep that act. It's important that we educate our communities on the availability of uh, of good health care. You know, that's important. And if you don't trust your team, go somewhere else. Amen. I am <laughs> on that. If you're if you if your team doesn't feel like your family, then you need to find another team. That's right. I was so blessed to have the most amazing team. And a lot of people don't understand when you go through cancer treatment, you don't have one doctor. You have like That's right. five, right? That's you right. have your breast surgeon, your plastic surgeon, um, your oncologist, your radiation oncologist, your physical therapist. So you see a litany of people. Yes. I mean, like you got to put them on your Christmas card list because you see them so often, right? Yes. And <laughs> yeah, so... <laughs> I will say, yeah, I was so very fortunate, but for people that have uh, no insurance or little insurance, or maybe not great insurance, they don't have those. I'm finding as I'm getting out into the community that they're not having these great experiences. Yes. So my passion is creating community so that we can support each other and figure mm -hmm. it out. Mm -hmm. So I love the fact that you will help people find a place to get mammograms. Mm -hmm. And I love the way that you advocate, advocate for your community. So tell me where we can find you. So Cancer Support Team, our, our physical location uh, is in Dalton. Our mailing address is 430 East 162nd Street, number 179, South Holland, Illinois, 60473. Our website, and please visit our website, we have wonderful wigs on there. We call it the Crowning Star Program. Our website is www.cancersupportteam.net. If you like to reach us by phone, our telephone number is 708-580-6456. And our email address is contact us cst at gmail.com. And how about Facebook and Instagram? We are on Facebook, we're on Instagram, and we're also on Twitter. Oh, beautiful. So we are connected yes, any way you that you want to reach us. We are here to support you. Oh, that's so beautiful, yeah. Karen. Yeah. Thank you so much for being such a, a beacon of light in the community. Thank you. And, and, and so just very quickly, if someone needs assistance, what's the best way to reach out to you? I know you have all the platforms open, but what's the best way? The best way, if they need assistance, is to call 708-580-6456. Okay. I awesome. man that, that line on, you know, immediately, and I will get back to the person um, as soon as possible. Beautiful. Well, remember, one in eight women will be Right. diagnosed with breast cancer in their lifetime. So we are talking about not amazing odds. Right. And so early detection is key. You know, I, I posted something on Instagram, make yourself first on the first and make yes. sure that you're doing your breast exams and advocate for your own health. If you have a question and you feel something's not right, make sure that you speak up. You are your best advocate. Yes. And even if you can't find one of us and we'll help you, yes. right? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So, yes. yeah, but you do have to be your own advocate. Absolutely. You know, your life is important and just keep asking the questions until you're able to make the best decision for yourself. Absolutely.
So Karen, uh, I do have a couple more questions for you. I was wondering if you could describe the experience that a, that a cancer patient has when they come to you. What happens? Well, first off, uh, our first introduction is I, you know, let them know who I am. But I, I let them know that whatever they want to share with me is confidential. So I try to establish a nice, inviting, warm uh, environment so that they can be open and honest with me. I, I believe that's really important. Then I just like to ask them, what can I do for you right now that will help you on your journey? And so I think those, those two questions is, is, is very important so that you can get a feel as to maybe what type of resources this person may need. You know, and then once during our conversation, you just reiterate the type of resources that they're looking for, and then, you know, let them know um, when you'll contact, contact them back again, you know, kind of a follow up things like that. I also do like to establish maybe a weekly conversation with them, just to touch base with them, uh, see how they're doing, maybe something has come up. Maybe it's something that they're not able to deal with and just simply help them work through that particular, um, that, you know, that particular Beautiful. circumstance. So really the wig is just the tip of the iceberg. The, it yeah. spills out into other levels of support in other ways. Yeah. And that trust relationship is built from the beginning. Yes. So that people know that you've got their back that you are invested in their health and well-being and that you're there to help them feel better about themselves. Yes. Right? Yes. I help them. Um, I, I, I often tell um, ladies that, you know, I'm the person you call when you are too afraid to talk to your family about something. You know, our family just simply wants to know that, we're going to be okay. So they, so a lot of times we're not honest with them how we really feel. Even if we're in pain, you know, if we're scared, we're going to die. We typically don't share that with our family because they don't really want to hear it, you know, just to be honest. They just want to hear, I'll be fine. I'm going to beat this. I'm working yeah. with this. I'll be fine. You are spot on. I'm so glad that you said that out loud because... I remember for myself that um, there were lots of conversations I didn't have with my family because they were going through their own grieving process. Yeah. They were afraid, they were grieving. And the last thing that I wanted to do was to bring my grief to them. And so the best thing that you can do actually is to connect to a cancer care community Yes, because right. people who know what you're going through, they can help lead you through it. You can learn from people who have the same situation as you. Mm -hmm. You can mm -hmm. get all kinds of tips and tricks. So if, I feel like every day I got smarter. Yeah. Uh, but I didn't have time to take care of like my family's emotional needs because I had to focus on myself. Right. Right. I mean, that's. Right. I mean, there were times that I was just army crawling out of bed because that was mm -hmm. the best I could do. Mm -hmm. You know, there were it's hard. It's a lot yeah. hard. I think, I think, you know, I, and I try to share that this is a time for us to be selfish. Mm -hmm. as, as women, we're nurturers and we take care of everybody, you know, and we always, whatever our needs are, we put those last, mm -hmm. you know, in front of the, 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 the kids, the husband, the job, in front of everything, you know, our needs come last. When you're diagnosed with cancer, you got to be selfish. You got to make your needs more important. You have to eat right. You have to rest right. You have to do whatever exercise you need to do. So nutrition is very, very important during this time. And being true to yourself. Talk to someone about your true feelings. Yes. Because that will eat you up. I, I could not agree with you more. And in fact, that's one of the reasons that I've dedicated my mission to people in survivorship, because yeah. really just getting through the cancer treatment is the first stage. And then what comes after that, if people feel like they, they're dropping off of a cliff because they're like, oh, you're healed. Good luck to you. 
And right. then everything is different. Your life, you know, <laughs> your marriage, your uh, yeah. career, everything is different. I think that's when I, um, <laughs> after, after the surgery, because the surgery was the last big obstacle, but after the surgery, for me, I felt like I was standing on a mountain. And like you said, you know, for two years, you know, I have all of this attention, you know, the oncologist, the radiologist, my primary, you know, all of this attention, you know, all of these tasks. And then, like you say, the two years is up and now it's like, okay, bye-bye. So now, you know, it's like, what? My whole life has changed. I don't even know what my new norm is. You know, I don't know what I want to do with my life. I felt like I was on a mountain ready to just kind of jump off. I did have to go get counseling to kind of help me figure out what my new norm was. Um, I joined, um, that's when I got involved with uh, the Gilda's Club, you know, because the Gilda's Club, there's people like me right so one day you're feeling great and the next day you're feeling awful those people understood your family don't understand because they seen you standing up yesterday yeah. <laughs> yeah. you know they're like well wait a minute what you mean you know and so that's when the the, the real support for you happens yes absolutely yeah i'm so grateful that you're part of this community and someone that I can look up to and reach out to. And yeah, I, I really am grateful that you're here. So thank, thank you for you so much, Julie. Beautiful conversation. Um, yeah. Hopefully it will be one of many. Yes. Mm -hmm. And thank you for, for actually embodying the spirit of this podcast when we talk about loving yourself. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye.